Welcome to everyone. Sally and I would like to welcome you to the first Stanford Global Energy Dialogue. We are living in extraordinary times. Since the beginning of this year, the world has changed dramatically. To understand this unique moment in history through the lens of energy, we at Stanford are starting a series of conversations about the future of energy. To set the stage for today's dialogue, the global pandemic has thrown the world not only into a global health crisis, but also a major economic crisis. As of May 28, 40.8 million Americans had filed for unemployment claims. Although last week saw some improvements, we have a long way to go. Unemployment rates have exceeded that of the Great Recession, and in some states it has approached those found during the Great Depression. This economic challenge must be addressed immediately. Since energy use is the foundation of all modern economies, can the energy sector play a role in short-term recovery process? And if so, how? We will explore this issue in our conversation. Now there are mid to long-term issues that cannot be ignored. With the growth of global population and economy, there will be an increasing demand for affordable and secure energy. At the same time, rising concentrations of carbon dioxide and pollution in the atmosphere pose a threat of another kind. Unabated emissions are driving the world to a point where decadal to century scale climate disruption could place the world in economic and health crises even more challenging than the current pandemic. We must address this dual challenge of energy access and climate change in the immortal words of Reverend Martin Luther King with the fierce urgency of now. Does the current pandemic offer a rare opportunity to reevaluate our approach and define a new normal? So just to get the audience going, we're gonna launch a poll and a quiz in a pre-pandemic business as usual scenario. Please note, pre-pandemic business as usual scenario. How many years do we have left before the world exceeds the CO2 emissions budget to keep the global average temperature rise below two degrees Celsius with a 50% probability? Is it less than 10 years, 10 to 20 years, 20 to 30 years, or more than 30 years? So we're gonna give 30 seconds before we close this poll for all of you to respond, and then we'll reveal the answers at the end of the opening remarks. Right, so let me continue. Putting people back to work by rebuilding a new clean energy infrastructure can go a long way towards these goals. What does the energy system of the future look like? What kind of jobs are needed? How fast can we move? And how can we help the world accelerate the transition to a cleaner, modern energy infrastructure that supports both economic development and a healthier world? This is a new normal we want to explore in this series. So joining us today for this conversation is the Honorable Ernest Moniz, the 13th US Secretary of Energy from 2013 to 2017. He was the founding director of the MIT Energy Initiative and he's currently the CEO of the Nuclear Threat Initiative. He's also currently the CEO of a nonprofit called Energy Futures Initiatives where he leads a team of experts providing policymakers, industry leaders, NGOs, and other leaders with analytically based, unbiased policy options to advance a cleaner, safer, more affordable, and more secure energy. We really cannot think of no one better to kick off our global energy dialogues. He has recently argued in an op-ed and in Congress that rebuilding a new and clean energy infrastructure could and should play a role to preserve existing jobs and create new ones, ones that are better than the previous jobs and ones that would help us prepare for the future. After Sally and I finish our conversation, we will have a student from the Stanford Energy Club 
continue the dialogue, they are representing the thoughts, ideas, and questions of other energy clubs around the country. And finally, Sally and I will hold an open Q&A session. So let me hand over to Sally now. Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, uh, no matter where you are in the world, we're delighted to have you here with us. Uh, what I'd like to do is reveal the first uh, poll. So if we could pull that up so that we can all take a look. Okay, so uh, the, the question was in a, in a pre-pandemic business as usual scenario, how many years do we have left before the world exceeds the CO2 emissions budget to keep the global average temperature below two degrees C with a 50% probability. Okay, so we've got uh, answers less than 10 years. Okay, well, that was the majority. Uh, 10 to 20 next, 20 to 30 next, and then finally uh, one degree C. So, uh, so the answer is, uh, is uh, 20 to 30 years. So, uh, so clearly uh, you're all very concerned about the urgency of this issue and, and rightly so. Um, but uh, yeah, so a little bit longer than the, than the average there. So, uh, so I'd like to just uh, jump right into our discussion with Secretary Moniz. So thank you again for being here. Um, I'd like to start off with that COVID-19 has shown us just how vulnerable we are to global economic disruptions. And as Arun mentioned earlier, many have made parallels to climate change, making the case that we need to accelerate getting to net zero emissions. You have thought about this a lot. So what will it take to accelerate the pace to net zero? And what is the right pace of change? And what does this new clean energy system look like? Well, thanks, uh, Arun and Sally. First of all, let me uh, thank you for giving me a virtual visit back to my alma mater uh, for, this, uh, uh, for this discussion. Uh, and uh, also, let me say that uh, in terms of the COVID uh, and climate uh, parallel, I think uh, I would also emphasize that uh, both uh, present uh, a tremendous need for uh, uh, what you would call risk management. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, we have shown that we're not doing very well uh, uh, in that in either case. Uh, uh, you know, on, in terms of the COVID, uh, this is the sixth uh, epidemic pandemic uh, in this century, uh, and we have not actually moved uh, to, to respond very well. Uh, so on the climate side, uh, I think one of the things we need to conclude and draw as a lesson uh, is that, first of all, uh, we better listen to the science, uh, and second of all, uh, we better take much more seriously uh, our approach to risk management. Uh, now, um, in, in terms of the pathway, uh, I, I think it's, and, and the time for change, you asked about what's the right pace of change. The right pace of change is uh, uh, fast and now, uh, and we are not exactly uh, uh, doing that, so we need to pick up the pace uh, uh, dramatically. Now, the pathway to net zero, uh, say by mid-century, and, and I believe that that is uh, certainly for the industrialized countries at least, uh, the kind of goal that we need uh, to succeed at. Uh, in terms of the pathways, uh, it always starts with efficiency, energy efficiency, uh, and uh, then with uh, decarbonizing electricity uh, where we have, in fact, made a lot of progress. Uh, in terms of efficiency, uh, I would just note that the, uh, if you take only the appliance standards, equipment standards that were put in place in the uh, Obama administration, to get a scale, we're talking about nearly three gigatons of CO2 by 2030, and we're talking about over half a trillion dollars of uh, energy savings. So in other words, that's the, and that's not even counting, uh, let's say in the transportation sector, uh, cafe standards and the like. So this is a very, very big deal and something uh, to which of course we all uh, can, can contribute uh, quite, quite directly. On electricity, uh, it is worth noting that in the United States, the electricity sector, uh, which we've always thought is the lead horse uh, in getting to uh, to a low carbon economy, 
uh, we are beyond 25%, so we're making some good progress. And many of our largest utilities are beyond 40% uh, in terms of CO2 emissions reductions. So this is uh, a critical sector. It's a lead sector. Uh, we are seeing leadership in this sector. We are seeing the opportunities for electrifying other sectors uh, as a pathway for the, for the economy as a whole. However, let's talk even about electricity. And I'm gonna be very blunt. Uh, we see lots of statements about uh, electricity decarbonization uh, by 2030 uh, based upon uh, wind, solar, and batteries. I'm sorry, uh, this is what I term magical thinking. Uh, it cannot happen uh, in that way and in that time scale. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of the wind and solar uh, uh, approach, uh, we did, as you, you know, you're sitting there at Stanford, uh, we did a, a, a deep dive uh, in terms of California's approach to deep decarbonization. And uh, one needs to look at the data. One finds that uh, wind, uh, it's terrific when it blows, but what about the nine and 10 days in a row when there was no wind? Solar, um, it's not surprising, it shouldn't be surprising that the solar resource is twice as much in the summer as in the winter. So all we're saying is that there are large variabilities. These will be critical components of getting electricity to zero carbon, but we need, frankly, an assault across the board on all approaches. So renewables, and batteries, yes, but we need storage for longer time periods than a few hours. Uh, we need to really push on carbon capture and sequestration. It's not universally popular, but we need it. Uh, frankly, we found in California that nearly 20% of their goal in 2030 uh, probably has to come from CCS in the electricity and the industrial sectors. We need to start getting hydrogen really deployed. We need to have negative carbon technologies deployed. What we need, in my view, is this decade to be the decade of all out innovation and deployment. With that, we can, I think, decarbonize electricity, certainly by 2040, maybe, maybe a bit earlier, which would be great. But then to remember that we also have all those other sectors, transportation, industry, buildings, agriculture. And I'll just make two points there without going into, into, the, into the specifics to say that as I already noted with the CCS in electricity, a number of those technology directions, CCS, carbon dioxide removal, hydrogen, those will also be critical tools for the economy-wide decarbonization that we are going to, that we are going to need. So uh, really pushing on that is important. And finally, um, I may have gone on too long and end, to respond to your question, but finally, uh, to say that net zero is the right goal, let's say from mid-century, deserves having an emphasis on the word net. The word net means that it's practically a tautology that we will need significant negative carbon technologies. This is a place where we have barely scratched the surface, certainly in terms of getting scalable solutions. And I don't mean by this only direct air capture, I mean other approaches, uh, biological approaches, for example, uh, uh, mineralization, uh, uh, accelerated mineralization, et cetera, et cetera. That uh, this is a, now feeding back, this is a good example where if we don't make the all out innovation push in this decade to get a whole portfolio of negative carbon technologies available, 
I don't see how we make net zero in 2050. And certainly by definition, we cannot get to the negative net emissions economy that we want to have later, later in this century. So I think that's kind of the, uh, it's the right goal. We've got a lot of work to do. Let's roll up our sleeves. Let's get on the innovation and the deployment um, uh, train, get that train moving uh, right now uh, so that uh, by the 30s, we have a lot more tools at our disposal uh, to manage, to, manage to, to meet our goals. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive answer. Um, what I'd like to do now is quickly launch another poll, which will tee up the, uh, the, the, next, uh, the next topic. So how many Americans are employed by the energy sector and energy efficiency sectors? And if you could answer quickly, uh, we've got, uh, let's say, less than like 25 seconds from now and then we'll quickly reveal the answer uh, that will pave the way to a deeper discussion on that topic. All right, so um, a wide range of answers. Again, uh, two and a half million, 4.2 million, 5.7 million, and uh, 7.1 million. Actually, those are terrific answers. Um, so if we look at the energy and energy efficiency industry, uh, that's uh, about 5.7 million. And if we include the auto industry, uh, that will add uh, another two and a half million. So uh, depending upon how you were thinking of that question, I'd say you all did uh, really well. Okay, let's, uh, let's close the poll and turn this over to our room. Thank you, Sally, and thank you, Ernie. Um, I mean, this is a university, so we have to use uh, polls and, and quizzes. That's what we do. So let's, uh, Ernie, just following up on your on the, uh, the numbers that you gave and the idea that the next decade is going to be critical for energy innovation as well as for deployment. Let's take stock of that in the context of the econ economic recovery that we have to introduce now. So let's take stock of that. Um, the 5.7 million people in, employed in the energy and energy efficiency sector 37% of which are in construction, 13% are in manufacturing, and these sectors did not regain their job losses in the 2009 Great Recession, and they are at high risk right now. And you have argued, as you just did, that you know, energy innovations and energy recovery are, are, pretty, are integrally you know, involved in this. So you have formed something called the Energy Jobs Coalition with the AFL-CIO, and I've proposed six priority areas. So let me take the first three. You've said, number one, energy efficiency and climate resilience. Number two, energy infrastructure. And number three, incentives for clean energy technology investment. So I was wondering if you could connect the dots between this energy innovation, the next decadal thing on one hand, and our e economic recovery that we need to go through right now. Well, thanks for the question, Arun. Um, uh, one of the uh, uh, activities that we have carried out at the Energy Futures Initiative, in fact, has been an annual uh, U.S. Uh, uh, energy and employment report. Uh, and uh, I, might, I might say that some of those numbers that, that are out there, the 5.7 million, for example, uh, uh, you cannot derive from the conventional Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, numbers. It's worth, it's worth uh, indicating that uh, because, for example, uh, an energy efficiency job does not exist in the, in the official uh, 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 way of organizing uh, the workforce uh, because, for example, uh, while there are 2.4 million energy efficiency jobs, about half of those are scored as construction jobs. Uh, uh, for, for as, 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 one, as one example. So, so it's big. But I think for the purpose of your question, it's even more interesting to note that over the last uh, five years, the uh, job growth in the energy, in these energy sectors that you described has been over 12%. Uh, of course, that's during what I would call, and I think you would agree, uh, is the very early stages of the energy transition that we are going 
uh, going through to, to low carbon. That 12 plus percent is, in, is, is an interesting number when compared to the economy-wide number of 6% job creation. So one of our arguments uh, is that, uh, frankly, um, uh, the energy transition is a high leverage situation for, for job creation. And boy, do we need job creation uh, over these next, uh, this next year or two. Uh, uh, you mentioned the, the large unemployment claims. Uh, we all understand that those jobs are not just all going to snap back. <laughs> the stock market might snap back, <laughs> but the jobs will not uh, uh, so easily snap back. So, so our, our argument is let's combine, let's put these threads together uh, and uh, uh, start that big push we need in this decade uh, in this energy transition, heading towards where we want to go anyway, you know, Wayne Gretzky, go where the puck's going to be, uh, but doing it in a way that will have tremendous job implications uh, right now. So we think that's, that's extremely important. Now, uh, you mentioned the, uh, our uh, partnership with labor. Well, it's a natural development in a certain sense, given our the focus on jobs. Uh, in fact, I want, I'd like to say that uh, we can discuss th this more later if you wish, but uh, one of the things at the Energy Futures Initiative that we have put forward is our framework for thinking about these issues is what we call uh, the Green Real Deal. The Green Real Deal starts by the adopting the fundamental principle of the Green New Deal. And that is that we must pursue our low carbon future and social equity together. Uh, and uh, I think that that's the case, A, because it's the right thing to do, uh, but B, also because if we don't address the social equity issues, that includes this jobs, these jobs issues, uh, we're going to have headwinds for that, tra for that transition. We want to make tailwinds, and tailwinds come from getting broad coalitions together, uh, labor and industry, uh, finance groups and environmental groups, a Democrat and Republican. We could go on and on uh, in terms of the kind of coalition we need, uh, but uh, that, that social equity dimension uh, must always be in the foreground. So that's why we have uh, emphasized very strongly the question around jobs and, and good jobs and why we've gone into partnership with the AFL-CIO uh, uh, to both support the low carbon transition uh, and make sure that, that jobs are, are part of this. Now, uh, in that uh, uh, Energy Jobs Coalition, as you mentioned, we kind of have six uh, pillars. Uh, the first one around uh, energy efficiency and, and, and climate resilience. Uh, and there, just to take an example, one example of what we think uh, we should push on right now to satisfy those multiple objectives modernization and efficiency upgrades of the enormous number of public buildings we have across the country in both urban and rural settings. One reason why that is a very interesting direction is not only for the energy issues, but also because to the extent to which we remain concerned about the virus, about rebounds in the virus, uh, about uh, returning to situations uh, uh, where isolation is even more important. Well, think about it. Public buildings typically don't have people in them uh, for large parts of the day. Perfect time, perfect opportunity to do these major modernization and efficiency upgrades. So that's just an example of how the, both the long-term and the, and the short-term uh, uh, issues can come together. I'll give another example of long-term and short-term. I mentioned earlier that uh, developing carbon capture and sequestration is, uh, is very important. And it is, and we need to move on it quickly. And by the way, one reason for moving on it quickly 
is because today there are, uh, with strong bipartisan support, major tax incentives as long as the projects start no later than 2023. Not very far away. In other words, again, there's a short-term impetus for something that will have long-term implications. But think of it in terms of the jobs. Right now, as everyone knows, it's, it's, it's very volatile, but we are in a situation where the oil sector, for example, has been heavily impacted by the demand reduction that results from the COVID virus. Now, the reality is that sector was under substantial pressure before the virus. For example, in the United States, we all know uh, that the, uh, the entire shale production based upon debt accumulation <laughs> as opposed to cash flow was being looked upon poorly uh, by the financial, uh, financial sector. The oil sector, we understand, will be having a secular change throughout this energy transition. So what's the connection to carbon capture and sequestration? The skill set is largely the same. The geographies will be largely the same. So in other words, as we have transitions in the oil sector, we'll also have transitions in the CCS sector, which can solve our carbon and our jobs issues uh, if, if managed properly. So those are just a couple of examples uh, in terms of how these longer term and short term uh, 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 issues fit in. Now, we also mentioned um, uh, energy infrastructure. That was our second uh, pillar uh, that, that you referred to. And clearly there are major issues like grid modernization where we could have uh, a tremendous focus on getting real, certainly at least pilot scale uh, and larger projects uh, going. We can address the, uh, the national need for a uh, charging infrastructure, for electric vehicles, for hydrogen, uh, et cetera. But let me give you another example in, in the same spirit of this short term and long term. I think the very interesting development of community solar projects, uh, you know, especially living in dense urban environments. You don't have a lot of rooftops, uh, for example, uh, but community solar, where you find patches of, of, of land that can support megawatt or five megawatts of solar uh, and be bought into by citizens in, di in different living in, uh, 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 environments uh, uh, is a very interesting developing uh, direction. Let's again talk about the issues of the virus. Well, you know, while entries into homes for putting up rooftop systems may be still uncertain in many people's minds, building a nice community solar project, perhaps close to a disadvantaged neighborhood. And we've seen that. I've seen that personally in Detroit, for example. Uh, employing uh, local uh, labor is a way, again, where we, we check so many boxes at once. We need to think creatively uh, along, uh, along these lines, uh, and COVID may, may, may focus our minds on that. And, and, and the third pillar I think we've already touched upon uh, is that about innovation. Uh, and uh, it's just that there, I think we could do um, uh, more. For example, uh, I think we could have a real focus on rapid prototyping of, uh, of new energy technologies. And that could be done with new arrangements with our DOE national laboratories. Uh, you know, it can be also technology transfer inwards in the sense of providing the capacity for our entrepreneurs to move much more quickly into the prototyping stage uh, that, can, that can lead to, to further, uh, further capital uh, uh, accumulation for those projects. In fact, one very specific one, and I, I uh, mentioned it since uh, uh, Arun, we know your special fondness for RPE. Well, maybe there really should be some follow on RPE grants that go to this prototyping stage, uh, uh, for example. There's so much that we can do and unleash uh, in uh, what I think, again, needs to be this uh, decade of uh, really juiced up innovation.
Yeah, I think RPE has started something called the Scale Up Program, which is precisely what you're talking about. Yeah. But let me hand over to Sally, and I know you have some follow up on this. You as know, well. I've, I've had one more actually, Arun. Sorry, before handing yeah. it over, just and I would say in that that thing as well. I think so many of these projects along their development scale could really use some help in the uh, front end engineering design uh, period. So I think, you know, uh, those gaps in the feed studies, in the prototypes, uh, again, uh, I think are something that uh, we could see some, uh, frankly, stimulus-like uh, 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 support for. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right that, you know, we always think of R&D as upfront and then later on the industry. R&D is all throughout. It's not just right up front. I mean, that's the research part, but the, the D part continues. And I think you need the R&D support all throughout the process of scale up as well. Yes. Sally? Okay, terrific. Yeah, so, so actually you had a six part, uh, six part plan with your energy jobs coalition. And, and the way I think of these, they're a little bit more the, not the what so much, but the how. Uh, so these included laying the groundwork for clean energy industries of the future, uh, clean energy tax incentives, and, and very importantly, workforce development, which gets to the equity issues you talked about. So could you explain these? And then also, how does the whole package fit together? Well, on, on laying the groundwork, um, uh, the point is that in some of those areas we've already discussed, uh, like CCS, uh, uh, like hydrogen, like uh, technology enhanced uh, carbon removal, um, uh, multiple pathways, uh, that we should be thinking about these not just as kind of you know, new products, new processes, et cetera. These are new industries. Uh, I, I kind of alluded to that in this idea of how the CCS and the oil uh, industries uh, share many of the same uh, techniques. And it's literally like building another industry which would have enormous job, uh, job uh, creation uh, uh, implications. So I think it's more thinking in that way. And I think when one thinks that way, uh, one might be going about things in a different way than we are now. Again, I think I would say a good example is, is hydrogen. Uh, I can't say for sure, and I, I, I think you cannot either, that hydrogen plus uh, carbon-free electricity will be the backbones of the very low carbon or net zero uh, uh, economy in 2050. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting candidate, uh, certainly, uh, to do that because hydrogen will then replace, in many ways, some of the fuels requirements that we have in, in industry and, and, in, and, and in, uh, in, tra in transportation. But I think what we should be thinking about right now is what can we be doing through policy and through support to build the hydrogen market across the economy? So it's not just a question of, and in California, I'm, I'm in no way uh, suggesting that it isn't a good thing, but you know, putting up a few hydrogen filling stations for uh, the very few uh, fuel, fuel cell vehicles that are there is not what I would call having a, uh, an integrative view of building a hydrogen economy. Uh, and this, for example, one of the things that we've recommended, for example, is starting out by, uh, by focusing on a set, geographically distributed set of hydrogen hubs, where you start and you incentivize uh, the supply and the use of hydrogen in so many different ways across the economy. You know, in, in a certain sense, uh, hydrogen could play uh, the role of natural gas today, of, of an extremely flexible fuel. Uh, 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 in, in fact, one might jokingly, I suppose, call hydrogen as carbon-free methane. Uh, but, uh, but, but again, the idea of focusing on building the market structures is what I would call building an industry of the future. Uh, so I think that's very important. On the, on the tax incentives, on the, uh, on the incentives, uh, uh, we've already mentioned um, the CCS incentives, et cetera. 
But I would say the incentives, incentives take many forms. Uh, one that I would uh, 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 strongly advocate for and have advocated for, and we think could be part of a future stimulus package uh, in climbing out of the COVID hole, COVID economic hole, uh, would be take advantage of the $40 billion left of DOE loan authorities. Uh, we worry about building energy infrastructure, a lot of the things we've already talked about. Well, there's $40 billion that can be deployed at uh, very, very low interest rates. Of course, now interest rates are low anyway, uh, but, uh, uh, but there are, uh, there is value, uh, uh, nevertheless, even now, uh, uh, with having the certification, if you like, uh, from a program like that, uh, but also, I think uh, I'm at least not confident that that interest rates will stay across the economy, uh, the place the place where they are now. So that's there. However, there's a problem. The credit support for those loans through appropriations was very narrowly defined in terms of some renewables technologies. Let's open that up. In fact. Let's open it up and do another of my favorites that we made a little progress on uh, in 2016 uh, when I was still secretary. We really need to get a major push on clean energy on Indian land, uh, where we still have in this country a lot of people without significant electricity availability. Let's use that, let's use that kind of a program but with credit support uh, to do that. So again, we can pursue this low carbon and the social equity uh, agendas uh, in parallel. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's the winner. That's, what, that's what's gonna get us home uh, in a timescale that, that, uh, that we need. Last pillar was workforce development. And uh, there, I wanna say that the number one issue of workforce development, and I believe my my partners uh, in 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 labor and the AFL CIO, et cetera, would strongly support this. The number one workforce development issue is create jobs. Create the jobs, will have the workforce development. For example, uh, when we made the announcement of the uh, partnership with the AFL CIO, uh, President Trumpka of the AFL CIO. Uh, emphasized that the labor unions in the United States, despite we all know that they, their, their footprint has, has shrunk in the last decades, uh, really since the 80s, but still after the military, they do more job training than anybody else. They have well-established apprenticeship, apprenticeship programs. Why invent new wheels? support those programs to go forward the way they have proved themselves to be very, very effective. Uh, so that's just one example of workforce development. But as I say, it really all goes back, get those good jobs out there and, and, and the workforce development will happen. Sure, it could use a little more push uh, from, the, from, the, from the government, uh, but first priority, get the jobs and the workforce will, will follow. Okay, well, terrific. Um, you know, clearly we need a comprehensive strategy if we're going to achieve our goals to accelerate decarbonization and getting to net zero uh, in time. Um, I want to switch directions now and let's, let's go beyond the U.S. and talk about global issues and the U.S. role in leadership. <clears throat> and in particular, you were instrumental in launching Mission Innovation uh, at the Paris Agreement. And how is that going? And are we on track to double uh, R&D funding for clean energy? And you know, just briefly, what, what would you consider uh, some of the highest priority R&D needs that perhaps you haven't mentioned so far? Um, well, I probably have mentioned the highest priority ones uh, so far. <laughs> but, uh, but first, let, let, me, uh, let me just maybe give a brief statement about mission innovation and what it is, since I'm sure not all of the uh, those who are tuned in are, are aware. 
So uh, in, uh, in 2015 at the Paris uh, uh, COP meeting, uh, that of course produced the Paris Agreement, uh, uh, by definition on the last day of the COP meeting, uh, uh, another event occurred, and, and I will say only partly tongue in cheek, which may prove in the long term to be more important. Uh, the, uh, and that is that on the first day of the Paris meeting, when the national leaders were in fact present, that included President Obama, uh, that 20 countries at that time announced a commitment to uh, at least to try to double their clean energy R&D uh, efforts uh, within five years. A big lift, uh, obviously, but, uh, but recognizing that we needed this big innovation push that I've said, well, now we need to start it now. <laughs> um, Clearly, uh, we're not on track uh, for that uh, doubling in five years. However, it's interesting that uh, in the United States, in the pre-COVID world, and now I don't know what's going to happen, obviously, particularly as we have trillions of dollars necessarily added to the, to the deficit. But it's been interesting in the last several years if you look at the data in just the right way, uh, you might say that we were on a doubling pace in 10 years. Uh, and what's very encouraging to me is that while the administration consistently proposed uh, reducing those R&D budgets very substantially, the Congress in a bipartisan way would have nothing to do with it. And in fact, increased uh, the, the budget substantially. RPE would be one example of, uh, I think in the last several years, Arun, correct me, but it's probably been about a 60% increase perhaps in the, in the budget, that, that ballpark. Yeah, roughly. About right, yeah. Uh, so um, so I think, the, uh, I think it's, it's important to uh, emphasize, uh, certainly in the US uh, context, that there is a very strong bipartisan uh, foundation uh, for this innovation uh, push. Going back to the international arena, uh, it's been spotty in terms of different countries uh, making progress towards the goal uh, and some, some, some really not. But I would say there, there are other elements of, uh, of very, very positive uh, outcomes. Uh, for example, one of the ones that I really liked was uh, very early on, uh, in mission innovation. Uh, Canada and Mexico uh, are both members of uh, mission innovation, uh, as was as the United States, of course. Uh, and so very early on, uh, uh, already starting in 2016, there was uh, the, the, the movement to have some trilateral, some North American initiatives. And it was interesting that, uh, that Mexico uh, took the lead uh, they got a lot of support from, in particular, the Berkeley Laboratory, but uh, took the lead in uh, holding a uh, initial workshop on looking at accelerating the pace of introducing new materials for energy through high throughput means combined with machine learning. Uh, and that really kind of uh, took off and, and Canada uh, got, got very, very much involved in it. So I think the idea is, and there are others, uh, certainly the U.S. is involved with Saudi Arabia in leading a, a, a CCS uh, 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 initiative, uh, for example. Um, uh, so I think there's been, certainly in that sense, uh, positive, uh, positive outcomes, in addition to at least some increase uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the innovation budgets. In terms of other areas that are ripe for that, I would add what I've already mentioned, the negative carbon technologies. Uh, this is clearly something uh, that everybody has to have a strong interest in, uh, not only because, as I said, it's the only way to get to a net negative economy later in the century, uh, but I think it is going to be essential uh, starting much earlier than that. It provides tremendous additional optionality and flexibility for what will still be the lead requirement of mitigating uh, mitigating emissions, but that is a ripe area for mission innovation to uh, to take up, and I at least will keep proselytizing uh, uh, for that. 
But I want to emphasize that Mission Innovation, uh, when it was announced in the um, uh, beginning of the Paris meeting in 2015, did have a second feature. And that was a explicit, it's funny, it's not, it's not an alliance, maybe call it an association with venture capital. Uh, and in fact, when the national leaders took the stage uh, in Paris, after they did their leaders thing, uh, Bill Gates was called to the stage to represent uh, a number of uh, individuals, wealthy, very wealthy individuals uh, from many continents who were, who were there to say, look, when you countries uh, open up the innovation pipeline with those increased investments and those coordinated investments, we're going to be ready to pick up uh, the products and invest in them and take risk and get them out there. And I believe, you know, it took a little while to get going, but I believe it's going. Uh, certainly, uh, Gates himself has headed up the uh, starting the breakthrough, the breakthrough uh, coalition. Uh, but I sense more generally, and I'm not saying it's all causal to mission innovation, but I am, but I am sensing uh, a return to clean tech 2.0 uh, in the uh, in the innovation world, uh, and that is happening at the early stage, the venture stage, but it's also going now through new groups. Uh, frankly, I'm part of one uh, looking at the growth capital stage. Uh, what happens when these when these technologies they go through the prototyping, they establish themselves uh, in an early with an early commercial foothold, uh, but then they need uh, another zero or two at the end of the at the end of the string of dollars uh, in in the growth capital stage. Uh, I'm seeing all of that now. I think uh, coming forward, and if we make this big innovation push in this decade, I think it's going to unleash tremendous amounts of capital. Uh, all across, uh, all across the innovation chain, and come 2030, we're going to be seeing the fruits of that, uh, with the ability to start scaling in serious ways some of these new technologies. Yeah, yeah, that's terrific. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think it's never been so exciting. You know, the innovation ecosystem. Um, you know, we are immersed in it at Stanford, and and I know at MIT, there's a you know, very active uh, entrepreneurship culture. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Arun now, and uh, he will uh, take it from here. Great. Thanks, Ali. And, and Ernie, this is kind of the last question before we hand off to the students. So um, just to kind of step back from the moment, historical moment we are living through. I mean, it, this is the global pandemic of 1918 and 19, plus potentially a, a, a very large economic crisis all coming at the same time. And they're of course interconnected. And my question to you is looking back in history on similar kind of crises, whether it was the pandemic, the Great Depression, World War II, post-World War I, and ask the question, are the lessons learned in terms of new organizations that were created, new ways of doing things. For example, as you have pointed out, after the Great Depression, there was the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Rural Electricity, Electrification Administration, Tennessee Valley Authority, Bonneville Power, that happened at that time, that led to a huge amount of growth. Um, post the Great Recession, there was ARPA-E that, that was created. But if you look back at World War II, where you know, people realized that it, this is a pretty crummy world that we're living in, the millions of people had died, lots of the global economy was in shambles, but we are all in this together. I mean, it is a, a global issue and various global organizations got created like WHO, as well as uh, World Bank, IMF, and, and many other United Nations, et cetera. So if you were to suggest something now, given this and, and taking a pause, what would be the new organizations that we need globally um, or domestically? What kind of governance should we be introducing? Can you give us your thoughts on that? That's a tough one. <laughs> uh, the, uh, first of all, let me go back to the, uh, 
uh, in the Great Depression, you said it, but I would just add the word hydro explicitly. Uh, and we are still, uh, of course, many major parts of our country are still uh, benefiting from the um, very, very large uh, carbon free quotes uh, uh, source. In fact, hydro has remained our biggest renewable until just recently when wind just kind of nosed, uh, nosed, uh, nosed in front. Uh, and also on the Great Recession, and of course you were part of the uh, 2009 uh, DOE team, uh, uh, the, uh, you mentioned ARPA-E, uh, uh, you know, I think that's, you could have mentioned a few other things as well, you know, Arun, uh, besides your organization. Uh, uh, for example, but I actually, I want to say that uh, there was, again, a very, very serious, of course, uh, push on, on clean energy uh, there. RPE was part of it, but another, another very important thing I thought was kickstarting the Energy Frontier Research Centers, uh, 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 the six of them, mostly at universities, looking at the hard problems for, uh, hard science problems for energy technology, uh, but also the, the loan program I referred to earlier really got kickstarted uh, at that time as well. And um, uh, it's had a number of, I mean, it's many successes in my view, but the, probably the most prominent one uh, being uh, at a time when uh, debt was very hard to come by to really uh, kicking off the utility scale solar uh, business in this country, uh, uh, which is now, I don't know how many, it must be 75 or 80 now, uh, utility scale uh, sol solar installations uh, in the country. So, so the Great Depression, the Great Recession uh, have had tremendous impact on what effectively is the clean energy transition uh, that we need uh, today. Uh, and so for the reasons we said earlier, including the jobs, et cetera, uh, this is the time to really, to really push forward. Now, on terms of, uh, and, and, uh, and also I would add the, um, you mentioned uh, in the Great Depression, uh, electrification of essentially every home in the, in the country, more or less. Uh, a bit less, actually, uh, as, we, as we said earlier, but, uh, but tremendous um, uh, increase in rural electrification. Uh, I would just add again, and I would put it partly in that social equity basket, uh, as we move out now, the, uh, addressing rural needs is really important. Uh, we all know about the issues of, uh, of broadband uh, access uh, needed there. Again, COVID showed the uh, inequities that can come with the kind of arrangements we've had to make uh, during COVID. Some people just don't have the access uh, to, uh, and that's both urban and rural, uh, to, the, to the necessary equipment and, and internet and uh, uh, et cetera to, to uh, take advantage of. So we have, we have a, lot, a lot to do there. Uh, on institutions, um, well, one institution, and I have to give credit to my colleague, uh, Melanie Kenderdine, uh, who, has, uh, who has proposed uh, that uh, maybe we need either a department of, of rural development. Uh, we have HUD for urban development. Maybe we need right now uh, rural development, uh, either separately or as uh, a newly enhanced part of, of agriculture, that would be an example of an institutional change uh, that uh, for the United States, that would be very, very important. Now, uh, globally, uh, clearly after World War II, the um, United States took the lead uh, in establishing all kinds of unique institutions, uh, financial institutions, um, uh, also in the security space, NATO, I, I think, unfortunately, people today, uh, even today, forget how unique NATO is uh, uh, in, uh, in, in terms of an, an alliance of, of, of countries uh, that uh, would move pretty much in the, same, in the same way together for collective security. Um, unfortunately, uh, I think today we would all probably think that uh, we've seen some weakening 
of those of those institutions. Uh, and I think uh, uh, probably the first answer to your question is to reestablish the strength of those institutions uh, as a foundation for for what we do going forward. Certainly, to get the clean energy uh, transition to happen globally, and we need it. You you said it. it it's right. COVID and climate are two issues that if you don't solve them everywhere, you don't, you don't really solve them anywhere. Uh, and, uh, and for that to happen, boy, we are going to need some real change uh, in the uh, financial structures. Uh, and uh, if these organizations are, are, are weakened, uh, that will impact very, very directly our ability uh, to move uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, other other parts of the world, uh, in, into into the uh, robust uh, uh, clean energy uh, economy uh, that we that we need. As far as new institutions uh, uh, globally, um, I'm not sure uh, uh, that um, uh, that we 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 need to go there, uh, but certainly we need to increase. Uh, our collaboration uh, 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 to, to go there. Uh, again, if we take uh, if we take Africa, another of these linkages that's not thought about. I might say that I'm uh, truth in advertising. Uh, I'm a co-chair of something called the Global Commission to End Energy Poverty, uh, which, uh, together with the CEO of the Rockefeller Foundation, who is supporting the initiative. Raj Shah, uh, and the CEO of the African Development Bank. One of these connections that has become very clear to this working group, uh, not, that it, not that it shouldn't have been understood uh, before, but with the COVID uh, situation, how can you have a serious public health system absolutely needed if you're going to be able to control pandemics earlier, early, without reliable electricity, mm -hmm. can't do it. So, Ernie, I, th I think we have we have only limited time left, and so oh. maybe if you could just uh, <laughs> yes. an answer, and then we'll move because we do want to give students yeah. some time. Uh, yeah, I don't want to interrupt. I'll end there. I'm just saying this in Africa. That's a situation that needs right. to be corrected on the energy side and on the on, on the on the health side. Thank you, Ernie. And we have now, we'll, let's hand over to the student. Uh, Juliana is going to come on board. And we have actually quite a few questions lined up for you from the, from the audience. So um, Sorry, I go on so long. No, 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 this is great. This is absolutely terrific. And you get us on the, set us on the right uh, tone. Uh, Juliana? Yes, thank you very much for the intro introduction, Professor Majumdar. And thank you, Secretary Maniz, for being here to kick off the entire dialogue series today. Um, so as Professor Majumra mentioned, this portion of the dialogue will be a chance for Secretary Moniz and also our future guests of honor to answer some pre-submitted student questions. Um, and in the spirit of the session being part of the Global Energy Dialogues, these questions are coming not only from students from all 50 states and U.S. territories, but also energy clubs all across the globe. Um, and so with that, um, in the interest of time, we'll keep it to just one, maybe two questions. Um, and so our first question, our probably most highly asked question was, in the context of advancing a more sustainable national and global economy, what are some of the underrated and underdressed problems that you'd like to see more young people consider incorporating into their future career paths? Well, I think the first thing to emphasize, uh, and, and hopefully your set of students um, who are plugged in right now uh, reflect this, Often we think about uh, you know innovation in technology as being kind of the answer, and it is absolutely central to the answer. But what I want to emphasize is that innovation in just about every discipline is going to be needed to uh, to address the issues we're talking about. Uh, we're going to need innovation uh, in business models. We're seeing that already in many ways in transportation, for example. Uh, but only scratching the surface. We need innovation in, uh, in policy and regulation. We need innovation in understanding, in understanding social structures. 
Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, I think this is a problem to be addressed. Uh, that we need to have students in a completely multidisciplinary way, understanding that they all have important parts of the solution uh, uh, going forward. Uh, so uh, in terms of the question, I just almost repeat what I just said, that for example, um, I don't think we have nearly enough uh, research uh, right now in the social sciences uh, to address the kind of transition that we need in energy. So that's one very, very broad uh, arena. Within, uh, within the technology space, something I've already alluded to several times, I would repeat. Uh, uh, and I think that this is, uh, uh, to phrase it most broadly, uh, how do we not just stop the, at least the vast majority of emissions mitigate, how do we fix the atmosphere? How do we fix the ocean uh, that we have, in both cases, managed to, <laughs> uh, to use a technical term, screw up? Uh, uh, because I, I think that, that, you know, thinking big about these kinds of problems uh, is, 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 uh, is really important. The negative carbon technologies are just one, one, of, one of that set of, uh, set, set of activities. That's definitely a helpful reminder, especially as students, a lot of the time it's very easy to get stuck in the, or at least focus very much on the day-to-day -day of every little brick that we're working on, but certainly zooming out every once in a while. And you're, and you're a chemical engineer, right? So you're- I am a chemical engineer, yes. <laughs> Actually, you know, I, I'd like to make a plug here, if I may, to all the students, uh, and frankly, all the others as well, all the uh, non-students. Uh, I, I, I recommend that you go to YouTube and look at the 12 and a half minute commencement speech given virtually by Admiral Bill McRaven at MIT a couple of weeks ago. Uh, uh, many of you don't know Admiral McRaven. Uh, he is the former head of, uh, he was a Navy SEAL, former head of special operations, uh, uh, including during the, during the period when Osama bin Laden um, uh, was brought to justice, uh, shall we say. Um, but he gives a very impassioned speech about the graduating students. He was talking to MIT students, but more broadly, as the heroes, from your ranks will come the heroes that we need. Uh, he emphasizes that uh, there's no uh, Captain America or Wonder Woman. Uh, you have to be your own heroes. And besides being smart, he emphasizes moral courage, humility, perseverance, integrity, compassion. And um, uh, I think you, you'd be well served to look at it. And it, it kind of, that's what we need uh, from this group of, 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 of students. Because uh, you're, you're the ones who got, you're the ones who are going to have to do this. All of you. Piece <laughs> of actionable advice. Thank you for that. Um, and zooming out for one final student question. Uh, very generally, what is the best piece of advice you've ever received, or what is one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self at the very start of your career? Um, I think I I was lucky in the sense that the. Um, advice I would give myself at the beginning of my career was advice I followed. Uh, not knowing that it was good advice, maybe, but I followed it instinctively. Uh, and that was that um, you got to really have a passion for what you want to do to solve an important problem. And you, and you got to have fun doing it. And when you have those, the prospect of those two things coming together, don't be cautious. <laughs> uh, go after it. And, um, and I, uh, I, I won't go into it, but uh, uh, I, I very respectfully, 
I chose not to follow the advice of my PhD advisor in terms of where I went. Uh, um, um, uh, uh, and then in my career, I've probably changed careers in a certain sense four times. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, it's just a question of uh, following your, your instinct, your nose, uh, and don't let, don't stay in a silo. You have, you'll have plenty of help staying in a silo if that's your choice. You'll have to take your own initiative to get out of the silo and um, look more broadly and have fun. That's my advice. <laughs> Excellent. So those are unfortunately all the questions that we have time for today, but on behalf of all the students in the global energy community, we're certainly glad that your own career path has led you to where you are today and to this dialogue um, with us as well. Um, well I appreciate so you, you, Juliana, and your, and your colleagues. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juliana. So let's go on to the questions from the audience, and they have been now uh, filtered and compressed and, you know, uh, assembled in categories. So I think, Sally, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so you haven't mentioned nuclear power yet. So, uh, so it's probably not a surprise. We have a question about that. So the question is, what is the probability and timing for a new nuclear technology to become a big part of the energy future? Yeah, thank you for that. Actually, that was just an oversight. In fact, I should have included advanced nuclear uh, in those industries of the future that we have to that we have to build build and invent, um, uh, so uh, uh, I think that the uh, the trend towards the smaller modular reactors is in fact uh, very very promising. Uh, clearly, we don't know yet if uh, if uh, if they will succeed in 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 meeting economic tests, but there are various reasons to believe that they have, first of all, excellent uh, safety characteristics. Uh, and these are, by the way, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, molten salt, high temperature gas, uh, so-called generation four uh, uh, reactors. Uh, although there is also, it, there are also interesting developments in light water reactors uh, for um, uh, small modular reactors. Uh, and I might add also micro reactors in the megawatts region, uh, one to five megawatts, uh, which can have very interesting uh, uh, applications. For example, in Canada, there's a very strong move towards uh, certifying uh, and deploying uh, some of these so-called micro reactors at things like remote mining sites, uh, which could have a uh, enormous impact in, in removing and removing uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions. So I think the I think we're on a path where um, I believe uh, we will probably see some deployment maybe of light water reactors uh, before the end of this decade, small, smaller ones, uh, and the uh, Gen 4, 2030, and maybe a little bit beyond. However, here, uh, this also couples back to the earlier statement about some of the new approaches we need. Uh, we really need a major public-private partnership here for these technologies uh, to get over the hump uh, or over the valley, if you prefer, uh, either, either way. Uh, uh, that um, we, we have never seen so much innovation uh, in nuclear fission, uh, in, in, uh, in my view, uh, but we've got to have some of those get across the finish line to at least being able to build uh, one or two um, uh, reactors uh, to, to know what the uh, techno-economic performance is. And I say that in particular because one of the um, economic advantages of the small modular reactors or the micro reactors is that they could be, they could be built on a manufacturing line in a, in a plant and have much better Kind of quality control and dedicated workforce than you have for these on-site on-site constructions. I want to add one more thing uh, in word nuclear. We shouldn't forget, and I and I truth in advertising. I'm involved with one of these companies uh, on the board, but I think there's also interesting promise in the fusion domain. 
uh, with uh, novel uh, no novel concepts. And um, we may not be so far from having uh, the ability to at least have a, a significant scale prototype test of uh, of a of a of a fusion device. So nu nuclear has got a lot of promise still, uh, I believe, uh, for a uh, low carbon future. Okay, just a really quick follow up: Does the U.S. lead, or 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 where else? Uh, the U.S. has got a lot of activity uh, there. I think we are we are certainly up at the front of the pack, if not ahead. But there is also work in uh, in in Europe, UK. There's work, a lot of work in China, uh, and uh, frankly, uh, China uh, does have the ability, uh, it seems, to fast track things uh, a bit more than uh, uh, than uh, than we do. Uh, so I, I think we need we need to pursue that. And in fact, since you raised that, the global issue. Uh, the reality is we also have uh, national security uh, issues to confront uh, with our, unfortunately, kind of vanishing nuclear supply chain. Uh, we have, uh, without being a major player in, the in, in international nuclear commerce, uh, we will lose our ability to enforce nonproliferation norms through our bilateral cooperative agreements. Uh, domestically, uh, it is a fact that today, other than living off of our DOE stockpiles of enriched uranium, we do not have the capability to meet national security needs uh, for the long term for naval propulsion, submarines and aircraft carriers, uh, or for um, uh, elements of the uh, nuclear weapons uh, program. So um, we really have, a, to have to pay attention to our nuclear technology supply chain. Thank you. So yeah. Ernie, uh, there's, a yeah. there's a question from the audience and this is about your comment on hydrogen. I think, uh, I mean, we all agree that, you know, to get to carbon free fuel, hydrogen would be, you know, a, a huge opportunity. Um, but there's a lot of R&D going on in hydrogen, reducing the cost of hydrogen production, carbon-free hydrogen production, whether it is electrolysis, whether it is methane pyrolysis or as, you know, steam methane reforming with carbon capture. What about hydrogen infrastructure to move it around? What about hydrogen storage? Because we know that pipelines, you know, there's a hydrogen embrittlement. There are issues with NIMBY issues with pipelines and permitting, et cetera. So, give us an idea of how do we address the infrastructure issues in hydrogen, both storage and transport and long distance as well, in a cost effective way that to really bring this hydrogen economy together. Yeah, I think that's, that's really, really very, very, very important. Um, uh, the um, uh, first in terms of the cost reduction of hydrogen production, I certainly agree with you and uh, uh, electrolyzer costs, for example, have got a long way to go and, They'll get there probably in a decade uh, uh, or so. Although I think, as you well know, uh, both of you, uh, uh, in the end, for um, splitting water for hydrogen, uh, it will require most of all extremely inexpensive zero carbon electricity uh, as, as really an enormous cost driver uh, for the, the uh, uh, electrolysis uh, route, at least. You also mentioned uh, steam methane reforming and, uh, and, car and carbon capture. And I would say today, that is actually a less expensive way of producing uh, low carbon hydrogen. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we should be using uh, as a bridge to build the hydrogen markets, uh, especially in, in some parts of the country. Uh, um, uh, again, eventually, and may be overtaken completely by 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 other 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 methods. But but we need to move now, and we need to, uh, as I said earlier, establish those markets. Now, in terms of the infrastructure, uh, there is both R and D. You mentioned the storage uh, challenges, but also uh, um, uh, I think on the uh, the transportation uh, of hydrogen. There are just fundamental questions open, uh, and this, these are the kinds of things we want to go on. For example, 
uh, I think a lot of people automatically think about hydrogen in a pipe, but it could be that hydrogen is transported in a liquid. Uh, and then, you know, and then freed from the liquid uh, at the uh, more or less the point of use, uh, for example. Uh, and there's all kinds of molecules being discussed as the, uh, the transport mechanism uh, for, uh, for, for hydrogen. So um, I, I think that th this is a case where there's lots of individual technologies and an enormous amount of systems analysis and systems technology that remains to be developed and settled on. Uh, the thing is, in the end, what we can't afford uh, is to have, uh, you know, a cacophony of, uh, uh, we're going we're to need some standards uh, for, for how this is done uh, in order for it to be economy-wide and, and, and economical. And that's the kind of thing that we need to pursue in addition to things like the materials research for, uh, for, for, for storage. Perfect. I think Sally has the last question. Sally, go ahead. Okay, so you know, we've heard a lot of discussion that you know, our new normal, you know, people are not commuting, people are staying at home, people aren't flying. So again, this is a question from the audience. You know, have you seen any signals that the pandemic and our economic response to it will accelerate a shift towards sustainability in our energy system? Well, I, th I think there's, there's uh, as, you, as the question says, I mean, there's big open questions uh, as to the extent to which uh, remote working, for example, uh, will become uh, more of a norm. I think there's no doubt uh, that there will be some element of that. Um, uh, I think today, I think I've seen estimates that today, approximately 50% of the workforce in the United States is working uh, remotely. <laughs> Using Zoom, I guess, or, or whatever whatever technology uh, they choose, uh, and uh, uh, I doubt we'll end up there. Um, but um, that's a long range. It's a long. It's a big distance between zero and fifty percent, uh, and I think we will see a substantial uh, uh, shift uh, there. Uh, I think that that will be associated, obviously, with um, likely with some fundamental. Uh, impact on the uh, airline uh, airline industry. Um, I've not seen good, frankly, good estimates of uh, of the of the carbon impact of various scenarios uh, that might emerge in terms of uh, revised social structures. Mm -hmm. But I also note that there may be some other uh, things that, that I've seen less talked about. You know, I did say the COVID, while it, while it has obviously had the contagion uh, to be truly classified as a pandemic, it is the sixth major event of this century, starting with SARS uh, uh, in 2002. And you know, SARS and MERS and H1N1, and you know, you go Ebola, Ebola twice or three times now, I don't know, uh, et cetera. Um, the point being that I think many of us have always viewed uh, public transportation as part of the sustainability solution. I don't know now. I don't know to what extent the public is going to be shy right. of traveling in kind of compressed environments, shall we say. I don't know. May, maybe that, maybe there is a even greater shift towards some of the micro mobility devices, et cetera. Uh, uh, and so I, I think there are some very fundamental questions here about uh, social organization uh, that we don't know the answer to yet, but, um, but I think we should be open arms uh, to see what, what makes the most sense and then just to make sure that it goes in the direction of reinforcing the sustainability that we, uh, that we want, to reinforcing the urban design uh, that we need to see changed in my, in, uh, uh, in my view uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So these are, these are big questions and uh, I, I think it would be foolish, I think it'd be foolish to make a prediction as to how it will look, but very important to explore the options and the flexibilities uh, and the way in which 
low carbon will be part of the solution, no matter what it is. Okay, I'm just going to ask a really quick follow up um, on uh, peak emissions. You know, I think a lot of people have the dream that, you know, 2020 uh, could represent uh, the year for peak emissions in the context that, you know, we've already had this big disruption. We've learned that we can live somewhat differently. Um, I don't know, what do you think? When do we reach peak emissions and, and could it be now? I assume you, by the way, you, you mean peak before the virus. <laughs> peak before the virus, exactly. Yes, yes, peak, the pre, pre-virus peak, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, I think that the, um, the industrialized countries, uh, I think, may have reached that point, especially uh, that the comeback from, from the uh, economic hole we're in right now may not be to the same place that we were before. I don't mean in terms of, I mean, the economy will recover, but I mean, may, it may recover, for example, with some of these things we just mentioned, uh, lowering overall, overall emissions and that we can sustain a, a, downward, a downward trend. Uh, uh, to do that for the United States, I'll just say again, an industrialized United States, uh, we clearly have to see the utility sector continue to be uh, the lead uh, and to be very, very aggressive uh, on, on, on that. Uh, many of the major utilities have adopted their own net zero uh, goals, but that's 2050. I think it's very important to see what's going to happen now to 2030, et cetera. Uh, now, it is, it is true that the virus has probably accelerated uh, the, the closure of some additional coal plants. Um, and so you know, the utility sector may, 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 may be there. Uh, I think one of the issues is the uh, still unresolved, um, this is stream of consciousness, but the unresolved issue of, um, <laughs> what was I gonna say? The, uh, okay, I'll forget that statement. <laughs> the, it was the, uh, uh, the, the uh, some, some unresolved issue. Oh, I'm sorry, I know, of cafe standards. Mm -hmm. uh, that is, uh, as I mentioned earlier for California, but more generally, uh, going back to uh, the more stringent CAFE standards uh, uh, and doing that as well for heavy vehicles, that's another important issue for the 2030 timeframe uh, in, term, in terms of peak. Now, in terms of other parts of the world, if I just flip all the way, the emerging economies are, are complicated. If I flip to the least developed uh, countries, uh, in my view, uh, there is no doubt that that they will have increased emissions uh, uh, and will need to have increased emissions uh, realistically uh, for a while. Uh, but of course, they don't contribute a, a large amount to the overall. And in, as far as I'm concerned, the industrialized countries should work a little harder uh, uh, while they have some economic development. <clears throat> but at the same time, I think we're being penny wise and pound foolish in not doing a lot more to support the developing economies in employing a lot more renewables and, and, and other, mm -hmm. other uh, uh, low carbon, have other, other low carbon opportunities. We've got to solve the, we can do that for electricity, but the heating and especially the cooking problems uh, uh, remain. So uh, I think we have solutions out there. I think frankly, it's, we need to really get on with it and understand uh, that it is a good investment to help that economic development in the least in, in the least emissions trajectory uh, as as possible. Certainly, uh, uh, I'll be to be straightforward. We know that uh, China, for example, uh, in as part of its Belt and Road, uh, is prepared to support the building of a lot of new coal plants, in Southeast Asia. Why aren't we in there? Why don't we at least have gas plants, gas plus renewables? It makes a huge difference as opposed to locking in now new coal plants in, in, those, in those countries. But uh, we have not, just not shown, frankly, the collective ability to, uh, to, to raise that in our, uh, in, our, in, our, in our policy thinking. Anyway. I think that's thank you. So, so Ernie, we have only two minutes left, and so I, I know this conversation can go on for a very, very long time. And 
there have been uh, very good questions uh, that have been posed by the audience, and I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them, and we apologize to the audience for not being able to get to it. But maybe we could just- Arun, I think you should have your students answer all of them. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) There are actually, the set of questions have been amazing and I've been following it in the Q&A and only a few of them have made it to the kind of the filtered stage. But let us, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us today. Uh, You gave your alma mater a great kickoff (laughs) to the Stanford Global Energy Dialogue and we are so thankful to you to get us started on this. And we are going to do this every two weeks. And, and two weeks from now, we'll have the 12th Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, um, who is at Stanford, uh, to, uh, uh, to talk with us, to have this dialogue with us. And we will continue with Chad Holliday and Colette um, Honorable and so and so forth. We'll have it every two weeks in the, in the Tuesday morning. So again, thank you all for and, joining and us. Going today. back to your earlier... Going back to your earlier question, Arun, you should ask Steve uh, Chu how we spent all that money in 2009. (laughs) Well, certainly will. And frankly, this is a very important issue. What were the lessons learned from that? What are the things that we should be doubling down on that went well? And what are the things that we should not be doing based on the lessons learned in 2009, 2010 on the Recovery Act? So thank you again. Well, thanks to you and Sally for doing this here. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. all uh, to all the audience that for joining us and come join us again on June 23rd, 8.30 in the morning, California time.